Now, I inform the Senate that at 8.30 today, 18 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate the following letter was received from Senator Polly. Pursuant to Standing Order 75, I propose that the following matter of public importance be submitted to the Senate for discussion. The evidence presented to the 2020-21 budget estimates hearings, which confirmed the Morrison government is always there for the photo op and never there for the follow-up, and that despite delivering a budget that racks up a trillion dollars of debt, the budget still doesn't create the jobs Australians need. Kind regards, Senator Helen Polly. Is the proposal supported? Thank you. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate, and with the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. Senator Polly. Mr. President, the evidence presented to the 2021 budget estimates hearing, which confirmed that the Morrison government is always there for the photo op and never there for the follow up, and that despite delivering a budget that racks up a trillion dollars of debt, the budget still does not create the jobs that Australians need. Now, this budget is full of flashy headlines that are great for the photo opportunity, but there is no guarantee that the Morrison government can deliver or will deliver on those promises. The government has a legacy of running away from the responsibility and ducking away from accountability, and the budget is no exception to that. This will mean that millions of Australians will now face further adversity in what has already been a tough year for all of us. Regardless of the state of our economy, the government has begun to withdraw support from it. However, there remains a high degree of uncertainty and varying degrees of social distancing requirements throughout Australia, and these requirements are in place for our health and safety and a great line of defence against COVID-19. But they also continue to be detrimental to business activities. Our economic recovery is pinned on the idea that we can control this virus. While there are still cases of transmission throughout our community, although the numbers are low, there should still be support for businesses and employees who face altered conditions and cannot operate at their full capacity. This government has sat on the legislation, for instance, on the National Integrity Commission for two years. After finally revealing their plan, it shows that they are prepared to establish a toothless commission that won't stop any corruption. It also won't be ready until the next election at the earliest. In the meantime, there's been rot after rot, which has been uncovered. The sports rot scandal, the suspicious payment of $30 million at, Launces, at Sydney's new airport that was worth a tenth of that, the fiasco of Minister Angus Taylor using forged documents subsidising billionaire Clive Palmer and the Cartier watches. It's crucial that this government is held to account. At Senate estimates, it was uncovered that the amount of money spent on consultants and contractors has been blown out. These are the jobs which can be performed by the Australian Public Service, yet the Morrison government is happy to expend an exorbitant amount of taxpayer money on high-level executives and managers and to look after their mates. These could be funded and that money spent on the APS employees and their work. The Morrison government is very good at making announcements, but they lack transparency and they lack accountability. Today, Mr Morrison made another announcement that will extend JobSeeker at a reduced rate until March, but he refuses to answer any questions about permanently increasing the rate of this supplement. These people need more certainty and a comprehensive plan to get people back into work. Simply announcing that there has been an increase in job advertisements will not do that. In the middle of the worst recession in almost a century, it makes no sense for the Morrison government to be withdrawing support from the economy without a comprehensive jobs plan 
to replace it. Now we have called on this government for some months now, and still we have seen no jobs plan. As payments get wound back, the money from the earlier access to superannuation dries up, and the suite of mortgage and rent deferrals ends. It will remove substantial support and mean that struggling Australians will begin to feel the real sting of this recession. This will come at the worst possible time for many workers, their families, our communities and businesses, just as we head into the Christmas period. These are always times of concerns for too many Australians, even before the pandemic. And now, with what we've experienced over the last eight or nine months, it's going to be a tough Christmas for too many Australian families, too many small businesses and too many people in our communities. The latest figures from the ABS have shown a fall in jobs and wages in every state and territory in the first full fortnight after the Morrison government's cut to JobKeeper permanent, prematurely. Further 30,000 jobs were lost in the fortnight to the 17th of October. 470,000 jobs have been lost since the virus outbreak began, and 160,000 more Australians are expected to be unemployed in the unemployment queues before Christmas. Since the beginning of this crisis, jobs and accommodation food services have decreased by 18 per cent. Arts and recreational services jobs have fallen by 15 per cent. Australians deserve a government that chases jobs and not just headlines. The Prime Minister has been slow to act during this crisis, and his government's deliberate decision to exclude Australians from support means the only lasting legacy of this crisis could be higher unemployment for longer and trillions of dollars in debt. According to research undertaken by the Grattan Institute, our recovery should be occurring much quicker as, unlike previous recessions, this one was brought on by government's restrictions and not financial crashes or conflict. Labor wholeheartedly believes active labor market programs should be created and sustained through the economic recovery. Labor has a proud history of using active labor market programs such as Working Nation during the recession of the early 90s. Australia is at the crossroads. As we are at a pivotal point in our recovery. We can rebuild our nation and ensure a more resilient and robust economy into the future. But all this budget is doing is handing down a one-year short-sighted response with no real guarantee of reform. This budget will put us in a trillion dollars of debt. This is a remarkable amount of money, but it doesn't offer any guarantee of ensuring a stronger economic future for Australia. What Australians are looking for now is real leadership. There were too many Australians that were being left behind before this pandemic. In my home state of Tasmania, there was too many families that were needing assistance. There was such a strong demand on our charitable organisations to give a helping hand to too many Tasmanians, and that was happening across the country. So at this time, more so than any other in recent memory, we need leadership from the Prime Minister. We are certainly in unprecedented times, and as many countries begin to experience a second wave of the pandemic, I'm thankful for our swift response to COVID-19, which has meant that we have performed relatively well. But there are still many challenges ahead. I want to put on record my thanks to the Tasmanian community who have been there supporting one another, supporting small businesses. They have been excellent in their response to trying to keep the Tasmanian economy moving. But we are experiencing additional challenges with the growing trade tensions with China and with many industries facing uncertainty over their future, 
We need leadership, as I said, from this government. Tasmanians' industries, Tasmanian businesses need certainty going forward. What we really need from this government is we need less catchy headlines from the marketing manager and we need more follow through. We actually need leadership. We need to ensure that people don't become complacent about COVID-19, but we need to ensure that we're working together to keep our economy turning. We need to ensure that there's less than the 160,000 additional Australians that are going to end up unemployed before Christmas. That means we need real action. That means we need that action now. And what we need is the Prime Minister to step up, follow through and less photo opportunities. Senator McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, I must have experienced a different estimates process over the two weeks because what I witnessed and heard was ministers and their advisers working tirelessly day and night to achieve great economic outcomes for all Australians. The mover of the motion has said or has asserted that uh, the Prime Minister is only about flashy headlines. Let me give some of the list of some of the responses, the responses which, have, which will deliver real action. The JobKeeper payment, supporting apprentices and trainees, income support for individuals, boosting cash flow for employers, small and medium enterprises guarantee scheme, early release of superannuation, supporting pensions, home builder. Each one of these response initiatives has preserved jobs and sets us up for an economic recovery. But yet there is more. And it's uh, incredulous that the Labor Party would be suggesting that this government is not focused on jobs. It has been the word uttered the most by the Prime Minister and members of his cabinet and members on the government benches. What we don't hear from the other side of the chamber is that real jobs come from real businesses. And real businesses need the free flow of capital, they need access, they need access to capital or debt, depending on how they want to run their businesses, and they need to have demand for cash flow. The measures which the Treasurer in the other place has instituted are designed for targeted response to achieve, to achieve this. In the recovery program, we have the job maker hiring credit, which, supports, which will support around 450,000 young Australians into jobs. And there's a job trainer fund providing up to an additional 340,700 places in courses to boost skills. The accelerated personal income tax cuts, benefiting over 11 million Australians. Supporting business investment, there's temporary tax incentives, which is available to over 99 per cent of businesses and, of course, as we all know, incredible infrastructure stimulus. All this generates demand and also provides a flow of trained Australians to, meet, to join businesses to meet that demand. I'm a little bit uh, unsure of what the uh, honourable senator, senator who moved the motion suggests by active market programs. Uh, I would suspect that they are more of the Soviet style, which is intervention and the government choosing win winners. You simply cannot do this. You cannot uh, generate economic growth without, without uh, allowing a free flow of creditor and individuals to pursue their own endeavours and their own dreams. I find it uh, also difficult to take that the government is criticised for not providing certainty. Everything in the budget was designed to give businesses in Australia some ability to plan, to plan and to, and to design how they wish themselves to navigate the way ahead. There will be challenges going forward. There may well be a second wave. But the government not, cannot be criticised, for it will need to be, remain nimble and attentive, and its measures will be adjusted as and when required. The, uh, during estimates, and I noticed the honourable member moving the motion mentioned uh, or asserted the excessive use of consultants. Uh, in, the, in the estimate hearings which I was attended, 
It was said time and time again by senior members of the public service that had used consultants, particularly during the approach to, to COVID, to bring into the public service those skills that they, they did not otherwise have and to allow them to respond quickly and effectively. So I don't, I don't think that the point is well made by the mover of the motion. I don't intend to address the issues of the National Integrity Commission because I didn't believe they were entirely relevant to the, um, the assertions that are made in this motion and that will be debated at another time, nor uh, the allegation of various uh, rorting, which the, the, my party vigorously denies, of certain community programs. The government does have a significant uh, comprehensive job plan. It was the fundamental basis and foundation of the budget. We accept the fact that the economy has been under stress because of COVID, but honourable members should turn their minds that in some of the states, particularly uh, Victoria, it has been the decisions of state premiers and their cabinets or their particular arrangements of, 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 uh, uh, to deal with the emergency that have restricted the free movement of people and the operations of businesses. Whilst the Commonwealth has encouraged uh, those communities to seek to uh, free up when, they, when it is safe to do so, the Commonwealth cannot be, the, the blame cannot be put to the, uh, to the feet of the, of the Commonwealth for uh, business restrictions. The Commonwealth has rightly uh, respected the states, as it must, and sought to provide financial arrangements to assist the businesses where it is able. I particularly uh, wish to address the uh, supporting measures of the flow of credit. Small businesses and small to medium enterprises need access to credit. Otherwise, they cannot run their businesses and I want or create their businesses and, and in the same time meet the aspirations of themselves and their families. The government has, has a series of measures which assist in the flow of the credit. And these are the SME Guarantee Scheme, the RBA Term Funding Facility, the Australian Business Growth Fund and the Structured Finance Support Fund. A small business, when it's under stress or when starting out, needs capital to grow depending on the nature of its capital requirements and what market segment it is. So while the government in its other initiatives has stimulated demand and confidence and a sense of surety in the community, from an economic perspective, that likewise there must be a free flow of credit. If banks do not lend or lend other, uh, other alternate lending institutions are unable to, give the, to give, uh, provide debt, then, we, then the businesses will not be able to run or they will not be able to underwrite their cash flows or invest in those things they need for their business. You need cash flow before you can make tax deductions. The government's uh, small and medium enterprises guarantee scheme supports up to 40 up to 40 billion of lending by guaranteeing 50 per cent of eligible new loans issued by participating lenders to small and medium enterprises. It has two phases. The Reserve Bank's Australia Term Funding Facility is providing up to 200 billion in low cost funding to the banking system to support the flow of credit and lower interest rates for households and businesses. The government's 15 billion structured finance support fund is making targeted investments through the securitisation market to support funding of smaller lenders. The government had a number of bank banks that also established the Australian Business Growth Fund. Now, whilst these are not necessarily considered glamorous by many members in this chamber, from someone who's come from the business community, they will underpin to a very large success our economic future. I might just finish off, um, Mr Acting Deputy President, to say that South Australia has fared well under Liberal leadership in South Australia. A projected 790,000 taxpayers in South Australia will receive tax relief. And in the, and in the budget that commits an additional $625.2 million over the next decade to land transport infrastructure projects. The mood on the ground in South Australia is good. And, it, and the South Australians that I speak to are thankful for the support that the Commonwealth Government has provided, provided them. I'd ask honourable centres to take heed of the fact that federal governments cannot of themselves employ every Australian. 
They have to create an environment where people can pursue their own individual dreams and from those dreams run businesses, start and found businesses and run them, and those businesses will employ people. That is, that is a economic reality. And whilst the stimulus has assisted the businesses in existence to survive, the new response measures will allow them going forward to thrive. Senator Seward. Dear President, I rise to make a contribution to this debate and note that we still have for every one job vacancy, on average, 12 people without work competing for that one job vacancy. So what does this budget do? Actually doesn't put any further money into the job seeker payment past the end of December. The government cut the coronavirus supplement, which I'm on well on record of saying we supported the coronavirus supplement, but then the government cuts it very prematurely, goes announces its budget without announcing what's going to happen after the end of December, leaving people who are currently looking for work, the 1.8 million people that the government itself is predicting will be unemployed at the end of the year, leaving them uncertain and anxious about their future. So not only did they not commit to further extending the coronavirus supplement, more importantly, they did not commit to a permanent increase in the job seeker payment, which everybody in this place knows is far too low at $40 a day. And then today, the government says, oh yeah, we are going to extend the supplement to the end of March, but we're going to take another $100 off you, which means that those people that are struggling to survive on the, cut, on the already cut supplement, will now, which is actually below the poverty line, they are going to be dropped even further below the poverty line come the 1st of January 2021. Happy New Year to that 1.8 million people who will be struggling below the poverty line on the job seeker payment, competing for non-existent jobs. Now, the Treasurer's excuse today in question time for that is apparently the Australian economy is recovering. Tell that to the 1.8 million people who will be unemployed. We're still a long way to get back to employment before the recession. There are still twice as many people on unemployment payments as there were before the recession, chasing fewer jobs. And oh, by the way, if you're an entry level, if you're looking for an entry level job, the stats are much worse than 12 people looking for the one non-existent, uh, for the one job. They are far higher, and it's far harder. Millions of Australians are still unemployed, looking for more work to make ends meet. And that number of children who will be affected by this, are over, there's over a million children that will be affected, living in poverty because the government has cut effectively the job seeker payment because the coronavirus supplement is paid to those on job seeker youth allowance, number of other payments. They'll be struggling below the poverty line. It is simply cruel and unfair, because not only has the government not, not didn't put that into the budget, they've now, now, now made this announcement that they'll extend the payment through to March 31. Now, what are people going to do beyond March 31? And what do you think people are going to do in the run-up to Christmas? They're not going to be spending a lot of money in the run-up to Christmas because they know coming at them is another $100 cut and potentially going back to $40 a day at the end of March. And actually, the labour market, and because Thank the economy you, is Senator recovering, Seward, does— your time has expired. Senator Walsh. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, Australians are facing the deepest, most damaging recession in almost 100 years, and they're facing a deep and damaging jobs crisis. The latest ABS figures saw a further fall in jobs and wages in every state and territory—every state and territory. 
30,000 jobs were lost in the fortnight to the 17th of October. 470,000 jobs have been lost since the coronavirus outbreak began, and 160,000 further jobs are predicted to be lost by Christmas. The jobs crisis is only getting worse, and it will keep hurting workers and their families unless this government delivers a plan for good, secure jobs, a real plan for Australia's recovery. But instead, we have a government that is focused on slogans and not solutions, focused on cutting people's income and support, focused on slashing JobKeeper and JobSeeker while people are still struggling. And we have a government that is going to rack up a trillion dollars in debt but somehow fail to create the jobs that people need. When the government delivered its budget last month, I hoped, I really hoped, they would finally deliver us a plan to create good, secure jobs. But no, somehow the government managed to announce billions of dollars of spending, a trillion dollars of debt, without a full, comprehensive and detailed plan on how they're going to rebuild jobs. This was a budget of short-term stop-gap measures, measures which had obviously seen more focus given to the announcement, to the headline it could create, rather than to how many jobs it would deliver and how it would help our recovery. Decisions taken by the Morrison government in this budget mean that this recession will be longer and deeper than necessary. So it's time that they stopped chasing headlines and started focusing on a real plan with detail for good, secure jobs. 160,000 workers don't need to lose their jobs, as predicted, by this Christmas. What they need is a government that includes them in their support packages. What they need is a government that doesn't withdraw support, like JobKeeper, too early, making their jobs more insecure. And what they need is a government that has a plan, a plan for everyone. This is a government that finds it all too easy to leave people out, to leave people behind. Remember when the Prime Minister told us that we're all in this together, when the government told us their support programs would be equal, that they wouldn't favour some over others. They told us that they would not leave the vulnerable behind. But this is a Prime Minister that we know does not deliver. Millions left out of JobKeeper, support slashed before people get back on their feet, programs announced and never delivered. That's what Australians have come to expect from this government. Right when they need the government to stand up for them the most, they stand in front of the cameras and then they run away. They disappear to their next press conference, their next doorstop, and they forget about the delivery. Because one day we're all in this together, and then the next, millions of workers are excluded from JobKeeper. And so many workers missed out on JobKeeper. People who really needed that support, casuals, freelancers, temporary migrants, NDIS workers, university staff, arts and performance workers, local government employees, charity workers, international students. Uh, and let's not forget those hard-working early childhood educators who had JobKeeper ripped away early. And now we're seeing more slicing and dicing of people by this government, more exclusions, more cutting people out instead of bringing people in. The government has left almost a million workers out of their plans for the JobMaker hiring credit, excluding workers over the age of 35 and employees who had been on JobKeeper excluding businesses who've been claiming JobKeeper, right at a time when this jobs crisis is only getting worse, right at a time when it is crucial for the recovery and for Australia's recovery. Excluding millions from support and then ripping those support programs away too fast is hurting Australia's recovery. Their decision to cut JobKeeper, their decision to cut JobSeeker, and their decision to exclude too many workers and businesses from this hiring credit. These decisions will mean that the recession is deeper and the jobs crisis more devastating for Australian families. We've already seen the direct and damaging impact of this approach, a fall in jobs and wages in every state and territory in the first full fortnight after the Prime Minister cut JobKeeper too early. 
And just like most of the Prime Minister's other announcements, JobMaker is big on promise and small on delivery. Only a month after it was announced in the budget, we found out that the JobMaker hiring credit program will only actually create 10 per cent of the jobs that the government promised—45,000 instead of the 455,000 as claimed. But this isn't the first time the Prime Minister has overpromised and underdelivered, because he's big on announcement and small on delivery. The government announced a $250 million arts rescue package months ago, but we found out at estimates that not a single dollar of that had been delivered. The government also promised big for Australian manufacturing—$1.5 billion. But they only plan on spending just 3 per cent of that this financial year. You always have to read the fine print with this government. And these failures to deliver are costing jobs now. This government delivered a big spending budget. They're racking up a trillion dollars in debt, but we're not getting the bang for the buck that we need and Australians aren't getting the jobs that they need. Some promises in the budget didn't even last until the end of the budget month. JobMaker, those 450,000 places claimed by the government, but it's expected to create only 45,000 jobs. The technology roadmap, 130,000 jobs claimed, but none included in the budget. The manufacturing announcement, 80,000 direct jobs claimed, none included in the budget. Promises designed purely for the photo op. And what about the other areas of policy that we know the government could invest in to create jobs? Because there was no plan in this budget for early childhood education, no plan for social housing, no plan for cheaper, cleaner energy, no plan for aged care. The budget had no real plan for jobs and it had no plan for the future. And if we really want to look out for workers and their families, then we need to get this recovery right. A recovery with good, secure jobs. A recovery for all Australians, not just some Australians. And we need a plan for this recovery now. We need a plan that means making more of what we need right here in Australia. Rebuilding and revitalising Australian manufacturing. Manufacturing that delivers good, secure jobs with decent wages. We need to get started on big, transformative infrastructure projects, projects that will actually improve people's lives, projects like high-speed rail and a new generation of high-quality social housing. We need a plan to guarantee apprenticeships on major federal projects, a plan to address the skills crisis by reinvesting in TAFE, a plan to recharge the workforce participation of women a plan to power our recovery with clean energy projects and renewables. A plan to rebuild good, secure jobs. That's what we need from this government. Jobs people can count on, jobs people can plan a future on. And this is what a Labor government would do. So it's time the government stopped focusing on their slogans, stopped focusing on headlines and announcements because it's well past time that they actually delivered. Delivered a plan for those good, secure jobs that Australians are crying out for today. Jobs with decent wages, jobs they can count on. Jobs for all Australians, not those that the government decides to include. Our undervalued and overstretched essential workers, they need this plan. Over a million Australians who are out of work, they need this plan. Kids leaving school who are anxious about their futures, they need this plan. So it's time for the Prime Minister to commit to a recovery that includes good, secure jobs at its foundation, a plan that includes more Australians and leaves no one behind. Senator McMahon. Thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, I rise to speak on this uh, matter of public importance. Uh, those on the other side of the chamber have said that we are always there when there's a photo opportunity. Well, yes, we do have photos. We have photos when we deliver things, when we deliver roads, when we deliver schools, when we deliver hospitals, 
when we deliver programs. We have photos when we actually deliver something. Those on the other side of the chamber have plenty of photo opportunities too, but not when they actually deliver anything because they don't. In fact, today I saw some Labor people from the other place out having photo opportunities because they're resigning. So you have a photo opportunity because you quit. Isn't that wonderful? At least we only have photos when we actually deliver things for the Australian people. I completely refute their allegation too that the budget does not create jobs. In fact, this government has been so successful at creating jobs that we now have a crisis. As Senator Walsh pointed out, we have a jobs crisis because everything has to be a crisis these days. The crisis that we have, particularly in the Northern Territory and in regional Australia, is that we do not have enough employees to fill jobs. That's right, we've been so good at creating jobs and also supporting people to not have to go to work that it's very hard for some employee, employers um, to get people to take jobs to fill vital roles in their organisations. I bring your attention to the recent Northern Territory mango harvest. Since March, mango producers have been trying to get and source workers for the harvest. They normally rely on seasonal workers that come from uh, Pacific countries. Many of these were obviously not available this year because um, of border restrictions. So they started looking for Australians very early on in the piece and, uh, and looking very hard for Australians to take up the role. Very, very few did. Uh, and in fact, one of our producers, who is um, partway through their mango harvest at the moment, reported to me the other day that they are $14 million down uh, because of being unable to source workers to take part in the mango harvest. They told me about um, one experience that they had, which was one of, of many, but they just used this as an example, of when they tried to get Australian employees through a labour hire firm. They were promised that four would be turning up. Um, the four did turn up. They turned up late on their very first day. They did a couple of hours' work and then they said they were going into town to get some lunch. Well, they never came back. This producer rang up the labour hire company and said, this is what's happened. And they said, oh yeah, they, they rang us and said, it's pretty hot and pretty hard and they don't really want to do it and they're going to go into town and go partying. And as, as this person said to me, this was one of many, many examples of when this happened to him. And it wasn't just mangoes. We have a crisis with pastoralists in the Northern Territory, pastoral properties that still have a market for their cattle. They're still trying to work their cattle. They're still trying to turn off their cattle. They can't get staff. Uh, in fact, I was talking to, to one very large um, company that, that owns numerous pastoral properties. I was talking to the managing director the other day. And he said, yeah, well, you know, some of the, uh, the smaller family-owned businesses, they, they really struggle to get employees. He said, we need to do all sorts of things. We can get employees, but you know, we need to do all sorts of things for them. Um, very comfortable accommodation, big screen TVs. Uh, we've put in uh, high speed broadband on all our properties. And we're talking really, really remote properties where it's extremely expensive to put in and maintain high speed broadband. He said, that's, that's what we need to do to be able to attract any staff at all. It's so hard and it's so competitive to get staff that um, you know, we have to go to these links to get them to come out here. But it's not only agriculture and uh, those sort of industries. It's the, uh, the bars, restaurants and clubs. I frequently go for a walk around Darwin and stop in and, and talk to many of the local businesses. And they tell me exactly the same thing too. We can't get baristas, we can't get bar people, we can't get waitresses. We're open, our businesses are doing well, but our problem is that we can't get staff. Um, the same problem, these same problems are occurring in, in Queensland and in other, other states, particularly in, uh, in rural and remote areas. We just can't get the workers to keep our businesses open. We've been so successful in creating jobs 
now we can't fill them. Now, if we look at some of the programs that this government has undertaken and that this budget has delivered, particular to the Northern Territory, which is obviously my passion, NT has received $250 million in JobKeeper payments. Bear in mind we have a population of just under 250,000 people. $227 million in cash flow boost credit for business. 120,000 Territorians are going to receive tax relief. And 20,000 NT businesses are eligible for business tax incentives. This budget commits an additional $189 million of funding for land transport infrastructure projects in the Northern Territory over the next decade. This includes $120 million for the Carpentaria Highway upgrade, $46 million for NT National Network Highway upgrades and $22.9 million for the Stewart Highway upgrade at Coolalinga. Roads do not build themselves. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. They don't build themselves. So all this funding for infrastructure creates jobs because we need people to build roads and a lot of people. Since 2014, this government, the government has committed $2.7 billion to fund land transport infrastructure projects in the NT, including funding announced as part of this budget as I said, to create jobs, because infrastructure does not build itself. The other thing I'd like to mention is the Beedaloo Basin, which is a key element of our gas-fired recovery. The Morrison government committed $28.3 million to the strategic basin plans around the country, the Beedaloo being one of five key basins. Currently, the Northern Territory has practically no manufacturing industry. There are several reasons for this, but one of the reasons is the high price of energy. The Beedaloo Basin has the potential to unlock affordable energy for the Northern Territory and to create an actual manufacturing industry which will create jobs jobs for Territorians and jobs for Australians. Then if we look at Defence, Defence has committed $8 billion to Darwin over the coming 10 years to build defence infrastructure. Again, infrastructure does not build itself. That $8 billion will create jobs and ongoing employment. A further $1.6 billion to upgrade RAF-based Tyndall in my hometown of Catherine. Again, $1.6 billion injected into a town of 10,000 people. That is a hell of a lot of jobs and ongoing employment. Then if we look at the NAIF fund in the Northern Territory, $300 million to build a new shiplift to service patrol boats and other craft in Darwin. Again, a shiplift doesn't build itself. Jobs will be created in construction and in ongoing operation. $24.2 million recent NAIF loan to Humpty Doo Barramundi. This is a 100 per cent territory family-owned business. This will uh, increase the size of the farm, uh, put in additional ponds and create a new hatchery. Part of this loan will create 110 jobs during construction and a further 160 ongoing jobs when it is built and operating. Now That might not sound like much, but to a small territory family-owned business, that is a hell of a lot of jobs injected into the local economy. Um, if we look at some national reactions, the government's $74 billion job maker plan is a key element of the government's economic recovery plan for Australia, designed to support Senator a stronger McMahon, economic recovery. Your time has expired. Senator McKim. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, this is a budget that delivers massive dividends for the super rich. It delivers huge payouts for the government's corporate mates 
and political donors, but it contains very little for ordinary Australians, almost nothing for working Australians and even less for those who are out of work. The Greens thank the Australian Labor Party for moving this motion, which allows for this debate to be held. Uh, but I have to say it is, that is this motion, slightly confused in focus. And I do have to remind people that Labor passed the tax cuts in budget week. They fell over themselves to get out of the government's way and give the very wealthy in this country a massive tax cut. And we know that the overwhelming majority of these tax, cut, tax cuts will not be spent in the real economy. They will be saved by people who are doing it tough. And history shows that that's happened last time. People got a tax cut. The overwhelming majority was saved, not spent. Or in the case of the super wealthy, they will just use it to inflate the share market and the property market. Meanwhile, people in the real world will continue to have to make do with the scraps. We've got a serious problem with wealth inequality in this country, and it is only getting bigger because of the combined efforts of the LNP and the ALP as they fall over themselves to give tax cuts to the very wealthy. And Labor's boneheaded attack on government debt makes it so much harder to fix the mess we are in. I remind senators we are in a recession and we effectively have two choices public debt held in common on behalf of us all, or private debt in the form of things like payday loans, credit card debt and bigger mortgages. And If the Labor Party wants to go down the path of more private debt, this country is in more trouble than I already thought it was, because we already in Australia have some of the highest levels of household debt in the developed world, and times are only going to get tougher. We need to be using debt to transform our economy, to invest in renewable energy, to invest in green infrastructure, to build the 21st century infrastructure that we need to, provide, to help us provide a good life for everyone. But at the moment, Debt is just being used to inflate the property bubble, to pump up the already rigged housing market and to provide corporate welfare for fossil fuel companies and weapons manufacturers. We can do better than that. Senator McCarthy. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to uh, support this MPI. Uh, and we talk about uh, certainly uh, the photo opportunities. You know what, Madam Acting Deputy President? An incredibly important photo opportunity right out front of this Parliament House, where the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander flags are flying next to the Australian flag. And in fact, there are so many of them flying out there, not just one, not just two, not just three. In fact, there's a whole row. In fact, there's two rows. Uh, on one on the left side of the building, and there's another two rows on the right side of the building. But you know what, Madam Acting Deputy President, in this time, in this one week, this one week out of 52, where this Senate and the other House could actually stand up and do something, say something meaningful for First Nations people in this country, this is the time to do it. This is the time to engage in a way that is deeply sincere. This is a time to engage and reflect on the kind of year that we've had, not just with COVID-2020. Let me take you back a couple of more months. The Black Lives rallies across this country, where thousands, millions of Australians took to the streets to remind every single institution that every parliamentarian steps into in every single jurisdiction of this country, 
that the deaths of First Nations people is still occurring at a far higher rate than it should be, that there has been no justice for First Nations people who have been in custody in our jail system since the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody. That today, when we could have done something to unite our country through symbolism. Now, someone said to me here in the Senate that that's symbolism. What's it going to do? Well, don't we have symbolism every day? When we come into the Senate, we have the Our Father, we give thanks in prayer, we listen to the acknowledgement of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples. So why is displaying the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander flags, national flags along with the Australian flag, such a hard symbol to reconcile with? And why is it that in this week of NAIDOC that the government could be so mean-spirited as to not dig deeper, dig much deeper? The government has actually had this motion before them for three months. It wasn't a surprise. I even went and saw the chief government whip and sat in his office and said, hey, three months ago, this is what we would like to do. Mm. It was not a surprise. You had all that time. So, Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, when we talk so, about uh, opportunities and photo Senator, opportunities— Senator, 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 sorry, just one moment. Wait for your call. Senate, Senator Smith, you, I, hadn't given, I did not give you the call. So, I'm not sure was that supposed to be a point. You moved you a point. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, there's no point of order, Senator McCarthy. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I guess gagging me again is something that the government wants to do twice today. Unfortunately. Imagine what they must be doing to First Nations people across the country. When we try to have our voices heard, whether it's in our local neighbourhoods, out in our communities, at the highest levels of parliamentary structure and institutions, we're put down. We're told to sit down. You can't speak. You can't even speak for one minute, heaven forbid. Have a think about that. Now, that is symbolism. That is symbolism of what you are doing as a government in terms of how you could better be working with First Nations people in this country. Use that photo opportunity of sincerity, of genuine engagement, of reaching out, of reducing the high incarceration rates of First Nations people, of using your national cabinet which you have so successfully done over many months to get rid or at least eliminate COVID to the best of our ability in this country. Use the National Cabinet to talk about how we can reduce the high incarceration rates of First Nations people in Australia, because you've shown you can do it. So don't dismiss us, don't gag us, don't tell us we can't speak. And let's Please make this NAIDOC 2020 something else to remember for the betterment of all Australians. Senator Bragg. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak about this matter of public importance, which is to do with the relative performance effectively of our country. Now, Australia is probably close to the best country on earth in dealing with this debilitating pandemic. Now, the Financial Review said that just four countries had fared better than Australia uh, when we underwent a 7 per cent contraction in the June quarter. Now, uh, other nations, as the Senate would be well aware, have contracted by 12 per cent in the case of New Zealand, 20 per cent in the case of the UK. So Australia has, in terms of a fair comparison to other jurisdictions that we would generally compare ourselves to, 
has performed very well on the economic front. And as the Prime Minister has said throughout this pandemic and throughout this recession, this is a real balancing act between the health objective and the economic objective. Now, it's all well and good for us to try and pursue uh, a health objective, but in doing so, flatten the economy, which is effectively what you've seen in New Zealand. Now, I predict that the recovery you will see in New Zealand will be very, very difficult. And in my own home state of New South Wales, I have to pay great credit to the Premier, uh, Gladys Berejiklian, in the way that the New South Wales government has kept New South Wales open in terms of its borders for the most part, in terms of its businesses, and then also deployed a very, very good uh, health response. So this is a health and economic crisis in which Australia has performed very, very well. I should say that I think part of the reason that we performed well is because our institutions have been very successful. The leaders have taken this virus seriously. And I think when you reflect on the way that some other leaders have dealt with this virus in other jurisdictions, uh, I'm not sure that they always took it seriously. And the Prime Minister and the innovation of the National Cabinet, I think, has meant that we've been quite successful in addressing this, this virus. And, th and so we have uh, been prepared to drop our prior commitment to budget surplus in the short term in order to deploy the economic stimulus that the economy has needed to get through this enormous economic shock. And in historical terms, this is a very significant shock. Uh, I mean, it is uh, going to be the biggest shock in 100 years. And so the JobKeeper scheme was designed to keep businesses united, keep the fabric of Australian businesses together. At the end of the day, the economy is underpinned by private investment. And so our schemes have been designed to keep the, the blanket underneath the private economy so that once the shock is over, uh, that normal programming, normal transmission can resume. So JobKeeper has been a successful scheme, $100 billion there. We've also deployed the Job Seeker scheme, which has been an additional payment recognising the extraordinary uh, times in which we live. In terms of the future, and I think that's what the Australian people are wanting to hear from us and from the people that are elected into this chamber and, and over the road at the House. The opportunity now for us, being in the first recession in 30 years, is what can we do to drive private investment? Now, typically, the two big levers that a government has are tax policy, and that goes to tax rates, tax complexity, tax administration, and then you've got labour laws. Now, we have very inflexible labour laws, very inflexible industrial system, and we have a very, very high taxing country. Now, these are two things that we should pursue in coming years with a view to having a more competitive and more flexible economy. With the recession we're now living through upon us, I think it will become clear to more Australians, especially young Australians, that no one owes this country a favour. And we have to be competitive in order to attract investment, and we need to be competitive to attract the best minds the world has to offer. And so that is a challenge for our government, that is a challenge for our parliament. How can we be competitive, knowing that we're always going to be an outward-looking economy and an outward-looking people? Thank you. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I thank Senator Polly for this opportunity to discuss job creation. In Australia, we accept that the government should provide the infrastructure and then get out of the way and let the employers create jobs. The less red tape, green tape and blue tape nobbling free enterprise, the more real breadwinner jobs will be created. The Labor Party has brought us Queensland's notorious reef regulations which are in the progress of process of strangling the life out of agriculture across thousands of kilometres of Queensland coastline. The loss of jobs in agriculture and agricultural communities along our coastline is a disaster that Labor's green tape has caused. Australia's Water Act, though, was the product of an unholy alliance between the Nationals, Liberals and Labor. 
It has driven family farmers off their land and decimated rural communities. Green tape is killing agriculture and killing jobs. United Nations blue tape is having the same effect on industry. This insane idea that power generation should not produce carbon dioxide, a harmless trace gas that does not cause climate change, has destroyed heavy industry and manufacturing in Australia. China is now producing what Australia would not. Labor, the Greens and the Liberal National Parties have all championed this transfer of jobs from Australia to China. China and India are now building 500 new coal-fired power stations to keep up with the demand for Chinese and Indian steel and manufactured goods. Renewable energy, or as I call them, unreliable energy, does not create jobs. For every one new job in so-called renewables, 2.2 jobs are lost in the productive economy. Yet Labor, the Greens, the Liberals and Nationals are out there every day touting a renewable-led economic boom. The only boom here is in the cost to taxpayers. Every new wind turbine costs Australian taxpayers $536,000 in subsidies every year. That's $13 billion a year in subsidies, and that costs every household $1,300 a year. Blue tape is not about environmentalism. It's about wealth redistribution. Large foreign companies win and small <coughs> Australian businesses lose. One nation will withdraw from international agreements that harm Australia's interests, and we will bring these jobs home. Senator Polly blames the Morrison government for poor job creation. I blame the Labor, Nationals, Liberals and the Senator Greens. Senator Roberts, your time has expired. We will now